Good evening, everyone. I'm Kip Cherry, Conservation Chair for the Central Group. And I'd like to introduce Joanne Pannone, uh, who is our Chair for the Central Group. Before starting to introduce our speaker, please put your questions into the chat and we'll be drawing them off to uh, feed to Doug. Okay, I'd like to welcome Dr. Doug Zemeckis. His talk will provide an overview of the development of offshore and wind energy off our coast and the challenges associated with sharing the coastal ocean among many different users. Many industries use the coastal ocean, such as shipping, commercial and recreational fishing, the preservation of critical habitats for fin fish, shellfish, marine mammals and other species, and now offshore wind. As a result, the coastal ocean can seem like a crowded place, which presents numerous challenges associated with developing offshore wind energy while considering other users of this space. At the same time, wind turbines will be located approximately 15 miles offshore, and in spite of a lot of misinformation and worry, will be very low on the horizon. Doug Zemeckis, who serves as a county agent with Rutgers Cooperative Extension, conducts educational programming and applied research on issues related to fisheries, aquaculture, and coastal marine resource management focused on New Jersey's Ocean, Atlantic, and Monmouth counties. We thank him very much for uh, coming and we look forward to our presentation and now I'll turn it over to Doug. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Jonathan, Kip, Joanne, for the warm welcome, the invitation to present tonight and the nice introduction. I uh, appreciate this opportunity. Uh, that was a great overview of what I plan to speak about, Kip. Uh, tonight, offshore wind energy in New Jersey, a very important issue here in New Jersey the Northeast and throughout the US as other sites are being uh, targeted for offshore wind development and expansion here in the US. I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the very many challenges related to offshore wind energy development and sharing our coastal ocean. Uh, by my core expertise is in fishery science. I'm involved in several projects, fishery science surveys uh, and others looking at marine ecological, oceanographic issues related to offshore wind. Through that, I've accumulated a, a bit broader of a knowledge on the subject of offshore wind, but uh, I'll be happy to share my knowledge tonight and answer as many questions as I can during the Q&A periods. Uh, I may not be able to answer them all. The questions come up not only from fisheries and environmental, but to rates and you know energy systems, transmission, uh, that things get beyond my expertise. But I have a, a good general understanding to share with you tonight of this uh, development off our coast in New Jersey. And uh, first, I'll start a bit more in, in, that, in addition to the introduction. I work with Cooperative Extension, Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Uh, I'm part of the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. Our experiment station has been around since 1880s, uh, as Rutgers being the land grant University of New Jersey. We're here to serve the state uh, through research and education to improve the quality of lives, communities, and businesses. Our history is deeply rooted in agriculture, but we also have research and education relate to environmental natural resources, fisheries and aquaculture. That's where I my expertise lies. Uh, food, nutrition, health, home, lawn, and garden, with which most by numbers are familiar with us at our extension offices, and 4-H youth and community development. And I'm 100% extension. I'm based off campus here in Toms River, New Jersey, in Ocean County Extension Office, where I am this evening. Uh, and we deliver science-based information um, from our main campus out throughout the state of New Jersey uh, to provide, uh, as I noted before, science-based knowledge to improve lives, communities, and businesses. And we have faculty and staff throughout the whole state to serve in delivering knowledge and creating knowledge as needed through research. I work in fisheries, aquaculture, and marine resource management issues, including offshore wind energy while we're here tonight to learn about. So a uh, good kicking off point that I use uh, when speaking about wind energy, shown here is the National uh, Offshore Wind Strategic Plan from the Department of Energy, Department of the Interior, published back several years ago now in 2016. I think this is useful to illustrate and communicate that offshore wind energy is being developed for several reasons, including the anticipated environmental benefits, 
but also economic and energy system benefits that are anticipated. Uh, as you see in the lower left, from 2015 to 2050, looking at from this report, um, sources of energy for the US. Uh, first, looking into the future, we have projected load growth from a growing human population. So we need more energy for that growing population. And there'll be projected retirements from, for example, nuclear, coal, uh, as some examples shown here. So this yellow area is opportunity space for new generation needed uh, going forward. Offshore wind as a renewable is one option seen uh, to help meet the energy demands going forward and anticipate environmental benefits from being a renewable energy. Uh, so there's energy system, environmental benefits, and anticipated economic benefits through jobs and other industry development here in New Jersey and elsewhere in the region and the country. Uh, but the Northeast US is being developed first for offshore wind, some reasons why that might be. Uh, we have the human population. This is back to 2010, but the I-95 corridor in the Northeast from DC up to Boston have a, a strong percentage of the US population. Also, a lot of the economics are here, the human, uh, human population, the GDP in the same corridor. Uh, we use a great deal of energy in this region, as you can see from the satellite image from NASA at night, uh, New Jersey inclusive. And also uh, wind is uh, relatively abundant and predictable uh, offshore. This map shows the wind resource of the United States. Uh, as you can see, people often ask what about building turbines inland or on the mountains uh, and actually off our coast. If you've been at the beach, you've been offshore fishing, uh, you know that it, the wind is you know, often present and strong along the coast. And that's shown here uh, along the Northeast. Another reason why uh, the Northeast is being cited for wind energy development first is the, the bathymetry or the bottom of the ocean in many regards is conducive, at least in terms of the continental shelf or from the coastline out to the edge where it drops off to very deep. We have a relatively broad continental shelf off New Jersey and many of the Northeast states. Southern New Jersey, you can go out 20, 30 miles, it's still, what, 70, 80 feet deep. Uh, so when if turbines are being mounted on the seafloor, uh, that's helpful for that type of technology. Other areas, for example, if you're uh, familiar with or been fishing on the West Coast, it gets deeper much more quickly, not as uh, wide of a continental shelf. So a bit of the nuts and bolts or cables and turbines, so to speak, of what this technology will look like, these uh, uh, schematics from NYSERDA, state of New, state of New York. Uh, but essentially each wind farm, the ones we're looking at off New Jersey are gonna be on the order of about 80 to 100 turbines per individual wind farm. Uh, there'll be turbines with interconnecting cables, transferring the energy to offshore substations, and then the substations transferring the energy onto land. Uh, at present, the technology that's commercially uh, available for construction are bottom-mounted turbines. Uh, right now, we have five turbines in state waters in the state of Rhode Island, off Block Island. That was the first uh, offshore wind farm built in the U.S. There's two experimental turbines off the state of Virginia. Offshore wind technology has been uh, constructed and operational for about 28 or so years in uh, the North Sea or other parts of the EU. Uh, and we are, it's standard, this development has been coming here. Uh, floating turbines, as you can see, are particularly, are needed in deeper water, deeper than, you know, five, 600 feet approximately, or actually, you know, probably actually shallower than that, probably about 200 feet and deeper or so. Uh, you need to more commonly are targeting floating turbines. That technology is soon to be commercially available within the next couple of years. Here off New Jersey in the Northeast, we're looking at about 0.7 to one nautical mile spacing between the turbines themselves. From the tip of the blade to the sea surface, about 65 to 100 feet. So these are very large structures. They're much larger than the turbines you see on land. Uh, the components can be put on barges, shipped out and constructed on site, uh, much larger than what is, uh, can be typically constructed on land and transported by trucks on roadways. Uh, some of the components of the turbine, uh, you have the tower, uh, three blades, uh, the hub in the front and the nacelle on the back is uh, where the most of the engineering from my understanding is occurring of the wind being turned into electricity 
and then cable down uh, in the connecting cables. Uh, from my knowledge, the most common uh, active producers of offshore turbines are Simmons and GE. Uh, if you're keeping up with it or somewhat familiar, there was a, a lawsuit related to the technology just settled a couple weeks ago. Um, also very interesting and in impacts the development of this industry, I understand. But here's an example, the Heli 12 megawatt turbine produced by GE. Uh, you can see it's 853 feet tall above the sea surface. So I think this is about... If you've seen the ones in Atlantic City, I think those are under 300 feet. So these are about three times the height of those. I believe the Ocean Casino at the north end of Atlantic City is 750 feet tall. Uh, so these are taller. And the, as the technology advances, they get larger. Uh, 14 megawatt turbines are being uh, uh, targeted for some other wind farms off New Jersey. Uh, I believe those are 1,050 feet tall structures. I'll have a little bit later on uh, about some visibility simulations uh, done by one of the wind farm developers. Uh, these are examples on the top of some of the different uh, foundations for bottom mounted turbines. Uh, I believe most common we'll see here in New Jersey are monopiles or jackets. Depends on the water depth, the substrate, the, the characteristics of the seafloor, uh, costs, and other maybe preferences and needs of the developer. So there are two different layers, uh, well, many different layers to this, but two big uh, uh, realms, so to speak, federal and state. Uh, the, I mentioned that there's five turbines in state waters off Rhode Island. They were able to do that uh, more quickly. The offshore development is in federal waters. Federal waters are three to 200 miles. Uh, BOEM is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. They're under the U.S. Department of the Interior. Uh, they oversee uh, and are responsible for the development of America's offshore energy as well as mineral resources. So they are also involved in sand mining and beach nourishment, which won't be talking about today, but that's another major issue for New Jersey. Uh, we're, we are, of course, on the Atlantic Outer Continental Shelf on the East Coast. I'll show where wind energy is in development uh, off the Northeast, and it's also being in early stages of development and siting uh, in the Gulf and along the Pacific Coast. So this is a table from a, a fisheries science paper uh, from a couple of years ago now, but I added it into this presentation. It's useful. Um, it outlines and lists the federal environmental legislation related to offshore wind projects. So these, this is federal, and there's state, uh, legis state legislation and review as well. Um, but this is a listing of the federal environmental acts that the wind projects are evaluated on including the construction operations plans that I'll show later. So National Environmental Protection Act, Coastal Zone Management Act, just uh, endangered species, marine mammals, fisheries, birds, uh, rivers and harbors, clean water, clean air, uh, just to name a few, as you can see the listing here. Uh, so there are many federal and then also state agencies involved. Uh, in this case, the, the leases are in federal waters, uh, and then these are the federal acts, but then through... Um, uh, I was going to say conservation equivalency, excuse me. Um, the term is escaping me. I, I apologize. But since the projects are off our coast and impacting our resources and industries, New Jersey is also involved in the environmental review and evaluation thereof. Uh, so if you haven't seen this before and you're interested in anything related to the ocean, I would definitely check this out. So this is the Marco Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal. It's an online, open access, uh, user-friendly interface. You can go online, you can toggle. You see I have seven active layers shown here, but some of them are, are masked here, but you can map information related to marine life, uh, maritime activities, oceanography, renewable energy, different habitats. Uh, what I have toggled on here are seven different layers related to offshore wind. The areas that are solid are already leased by developers from the federal government, from BOEM, to explore and pursue the development of offshore wind energy construction in those leases. These red areas are draft call for information and nomination areas. All these other wind leases started off in these very large areas. There were a series of task force meetings, public hearing, other evaluations, uh, stakeholder input. They get widowed down to areas that are least conflicted for with human and non-human users of the marine environment. 
So these are some other sites where we might expect further leasing by developers from Bone in the future. Uh, but the first leases came off Seller New England, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. Uh, and then the first leases here off Southern New Jersey were leased in 2015, actually. So seven years ago already. Uh, many people don't realize uh, the timelines that have been involved here. Um, most uh, fishermen, most of the general public didn't really start becoming aware of wind energy until, the, until this lease site, now known Empire Wind, originally leased. It was leased by Stat Oil. They've changed their name now to uh, Equinor. Uh, they leased this in 2017 for, I think, 42 or 44 million. Um, but uh, that's when it started, this issue of wind energy started more commonly making it out into the mainstream news and onto people's attentions. Uh, the most recent lease sites were these six lease sites in the New York Bight in green. Uh, those were leased this February 2022 for a combined total, I think, of $4.3 billion dollars. Uh, so the previous approximately 18 leases went for a little under 500 million. The more recent six went for $4.3 billion. So it paid if you were a developer to get in early. So I'll show later uh, the, the phase, the status of the, some of the projects off New Jersey. Uh, but here is the timeline uh, from a federal standpoint through BOEM, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, so if, if there's a public auction for the developers to bid at leasing, um, there's at least a two-year process before that of uh, identifying potential wind energy areas, NEPA environmental reviews, uh, published leasing notices um, before an auction actually occurs. We'll see for Southern New Jersey and elsewhere, there's a whole bunch that hap happens before that as well. So after a lease is granted, uh, the developers then enter a main, soon thereafter, enter a main phase of site assessment, doing site assessments and surveys for up to five years. They develop a COP, construction operations plan, that then gets reviewed by all those uh, federal acts that we saw earlier and more, plus state level evaluation. Uh, and once the, bone, once the COP is uh, potentially approved, uh, then they can begin installation. At this point, only two COPs have been approved in U.S. waters. I believe it's Vineyard Wind and South Fork off of Rhode Island, Massachusetts area, respectively. As I'll show later, there's uh, at least two projects off New Jersey, uh, a bit more that have their COPs currently in review. So showing a bit about uh, some of the challenges in sharing the coastal ocean. Again, this is the Marco data portal. Uh, in maritime, they have information on shipping. I, the most recent, when I pulled this screenshot, data available was 2020. As we all know, that was the first year and the height of the pandemic, most disruptive to commerce. Um, but this is showing in 2020, cargo vessels, tanker vessels, and tug and tow vessels using the coastal ocean. If you've ever been on the beach or been out fishing day or night, you've likely seen all the tugboats that are about five to eight miles off the coast. That's this heavily utilized area showing up bright green along the coast. That's the tug and tow traffic. A lot of it you see between New York and, and Philadelphia. You have the approaches and departures, three sets of them into New York City. Uh, so you see, obviously that's major important commerce right there alone that would be conflicting with uh, bottom mounted stationary turbines. The wind leases are avoiding those major shipping uh, lanes as well as other, other areas. Um, here in New Jersey, we have the number four most valuable commercial fishing and seafood industry out of the 50 states in the US. Uh, our most valuable commercial fishery is the commercial sea scallop fishery. It, uh, the, the X vessel or farm gate value to the fishermen is about a, maybe about 100 million or so, could be more, especially lately, uh, 150 million. Multiply that by five and you get about a 500 million uh, $750 million industry to the state of New Jersey and the net economic impact. So very important industry in terms of value, socio-cultural dynamics, and seafood production. Uh, as part of federal fishery management policy, uh, they have to have a VMS, vessel monitoring system, on their boat, uh, and they report their position to the government every 30 minutes when they leave the dock. These are just two years worth of data, all speeds, 
and less than five knots, that's an indicator of when they're actually actively fishing. And you can see the areas where these commercial fishing boats utilize off the coast. Most of them come out of Atlantic City, uh, Cape May, some out of AC, but then also Barney Light, Point Pleasant. See where they transit. A lot of boats come down from Stonington, Connecticut, Point Judith, Rhode Island, New Bedford, Massachusetts. And there's a great deal of commercial fishing off our coast here. Some of the most valuable grounds in the Northeast. Uh, example, exampled here by sea scallops, but we'll show also um, here is our second most valuable commercial fishery, surf clams, ocean cohogs, call it with hydraulic dredges, 80 to 120 foot boats approximately, mostly out of Atlantic City, Point Pleasant, also Cape May. You get an idea of where they're, this is only two years, uh, where they're transiting, where they're actively fishing. Again, heavily conflicted areas further offshore. These boats pull these dredges, they're large, uh, and they don't anticipate being able to fish between the turbines uh, safely or effectively. The Coast Guard and developers are not going to restrict access, but based upon the spacing of the turbines, uh, the cables, other users and shipping traffic, weather, um, not anticipating being able to access these wind farms for these types of fisheries. Also, our most, one of our top three most valuable commercial fisheries in recent years is for short fin and long fin squid out of Cape May, Point Pleasant, Belford, and Monmouth County. Again, you get an idea where they're transiting, spending all their time and fishing, uh, inclusive a bit deeper where the squid are found out towards the edge. So summarizing, I've built up from the years and being involved in fisheries and offshore wind issues the last several years. I have this slide here, which not only from fishing industry concerns and potential fisheries impacts, it's relevant to other user groups and environmental issues more broadly. On the fishery side, they're concerned about accessibility. Uh, before, uh, as I noted, the developers and Coast Guard are not going to restrict access. Uh, but before uh, construction, there's a great deal of survey vessels that are out there that have already presented in some instances some conflict of fishermen trying to fish with uh, survey boats doing their work. Uh, there's going to be other activity during and then after construction when there's turbines. Uh, there's been a variety of groups and developers, bone state agencies working with the fishing industry to try to mitigate impacts, maximize compatibility um, in terms of placement and spacing of turbines and cables, uh, including uh, access corridors, transit corridors in some instances. Um, but yet, even if uh, with those uh, arrangements, just the, given the nature of some of the types of fishing gear, the sizes of the boats, uh, and the, the spacing of the turbines, uh, concerns about being able to access safely and effectively, and then whether or not the insurance companies would cover them, even if there, if there was an issue when they were fishing within them. So there's a lot of uh, layers to the access issues. Uh, the NOAA National Marine Fishery Service runs a bottom trawl survey from Cape Hat. At Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, into Canadian waters since approximately 1968. It's the longest running time series of such type of survey uh, in the country and one of the longest in the world. It is the backbone of much of our fisheries science and our fisheries management in the region. Uh, NOAA has concluded in, that they will not be able to safely and effectively conduct their trawl survey uh, within wind farms that are going to be from North Carolina and then eventually up to Maine. So that's going to be a major disruption to our, our fishery science and management. Uh, and then a lot of conversations come around cumulative impacts, whether there's one wind farm, five wind farms off New Jersey, or if there's you know 20 something wind farms off the Mid-Atlantic Bight, um, how that might impact access, but also ecosystem impacts. Some of the ecosystem impacts can be uh, grouped into physical and biological processes. Uh, for example, a relatively easy question is to quantify how much energy is coming out of the system from the turbines. A much harder uh, scientific question is to uh, estimate how that impacts the atmosphere. The atmosphere is like a, a fluid, has a lot of layers, uh, and it's obviously dynamic and variable. So uh, some of our oceanographers and atmospheric scientists are trying to better understand uh, how uh, pulling energy out will change the atmospheric dynamics and then how that might interact with the oceanography. A lot of our currents are surface, surface, a lot of our surface currents are primarily driven by wind. Uh, so that ocean atmosphere coupling might also influence currents as well as the cold pool. We have a very unique 
corner of the ocean in the global scale, uh, global um, lens here off New Jersey. Uh, we have the Gulf Stream current that comes up from uh, Western Florida, comes up along the Atlantic coast, brings warm water to New Jersey. We, there's the Labrador current, which comes down from Atlantic Canada, Greenland, uh, comes down around the Grand Banks, New Finland, George's Bank, and they, those currents interact off our coast. If anyone goes fishing, uh, if you're outside fishing in August, you might catch a mahi-mahi or a tuna on the surface. You drop down, you might catch a cod, a winter flounder, or, or a ling, red hake. Uh, those ling and red hake, also the sea scallops, the surf clams, they're living in that cold water that gets transported down uh, by the uh, Labrador current. Our oceanographers are working to answer the questions on if the cold pool and surface currents, how they might be impacted um, by uh, energy being harvested by the turbines. And then ec ecologically, from a fishery standpoint, um, how might this construction, the operation, the turbines harvesting wind, how might that impact the distribution, behavior, uh, reproduction, or even survival of marine fishery resources? Some work done off uh, southern New England showing from one and then successive build out to multiple wind farms will impact the surface currents. So where the surf clams are currently spawning off of uh, east of Nantucket, the currents would carry a lot of their eggs and larvae down towards mass southern, uh, southern New England and even the mid-Atlantic. And the change in surface currents from successive build out of multiple wind farms has been shown that's gonna change where the eggs and larvae are transported. So off our coast, we have summer flounder, which spawn offshore, black sea bass near shore. Um, how might the transport of the eggs and larvae be impacted? Which is an important question. Uh, and a lot of stakeholders are concerned if EMFs, electromagnetic fields from the cables, which are planned to be buried about one and a half to two meters deep, will those EMFs be uh, sensed, capable of being sensed at the sediment interface? And will that perhaps disrupt some of the, the species that are uh, electroreceptive if those fields are uh, present? Uh, navigation and safety concerns uh, during fishing while transiting. So commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, recreational boaters, sailboats, and also the shipping industry. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences was tasked with putting together a team this year uh, to address a variety of stakeholder concerns of how the turbines might impact ship-based radar system, both X and S-band radar. Um, that panel of experts concluded that in some scenarios, there will be significant impacts on the radar systems used on many of the boats. So there's efforts ongoing to mitigate some of the safety issues from a, a navigational standpoint, such as putting AIS locator beacons on each turbine, um, but not all boats have the technology to um, detect AIS. So uh, definitely a lot of work to be done on the, on the safety fronts. Uh, so that was a, a dive into the fisheries, but relevant to other species. I don't spend much time on, on seabird issues, but if you want to use the Marco Pool uh, portal, you can also look at a suite of bird migration data. This is my favorite seabird, though, the northern gannet. This is their winter distribution. Uh, you can get an idea of the winter, spring, summer, fall. I think all four seasons as available, the distribution of these seabirds to see how their habitats overlap with um, sites for offshore wind development. Uh, there are efforts ongoing to mitigate bird injuries and mortalities in terms of spacing, lighting, uh, coloration of the blades and the turbines themselves. Um, I didn't have a slide here, but you can also go in here in marine mammals. Another major issue in offshore wind is the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale and the habitats that they utilize throughout the whole East Coast and beyond. You can get data from this portal, maps, and where and when uh, the right whales off our coast, particularly during the colder months, uh, winter months, there's concerns about construction activities and noise, how that might disrupt and impact uh, uh, North Atlantic right whales. There are mitigating measures that the developers will have to follow. Rutgers has done research off New Jersey, elsewhere other researchers off southern New England to better understand the when and where right whales are around. Some of the construction I anticipate is going to be halted during times when right whales are around. And then there are uh, pile driving, other bubble sound, bubble curtains, uh, mitigating measures that the developers 
I expect in almost all instances will have to follow uh, in order to mitigate impacts uh, to right whales and other marine mammals. And when you go to a, a task force meeting for offshore wind, it's amazing the diversity of stakeholders that are there, uh, including folks involved in our national security. Uh, Marco also has data on the military uh, uses of our ocean. I just have two here for illustration, the special use airspace and air boundaries. Um, hearing those comments in some of those meetings, it's surprising uh, without having ever been exposed to that, how many uh, uh, military operations happen off our coast. So those are, excuse me, other matters that definitely have to be considered in siting and operations. Uh, when you're talking off southern New Jersey, those leases are within uh, a given distance of the international airport of Atlantic City. So national security concerns arise from that. And if we end up having about 50% or more of our state energy from these turbines, that also raises some security issues uh, that are part of the conversations that I, uh, I'm not involved with, but I know there, I know that's ongoing. Uh, I can keep going, I'll power through, Kip. Uh, so uh, NJDEP has, uh, I think last year they launched an offshore wind uh, webpage, the links below. I'll have a screenshot of it again later, but to get an idea of the uh, offshore wind policy. So there's leasing in federal waters, then each state also has their policy. They're putting out uh, their own respective calls in each state to meet their energy goals. And then the developers are, you know, will be setting up contract certificates to sell energy to each state that puts out the, the solicitations. Uh, in New Jersey, back in 2010, 12 years ago now, uh, OWIDA, the Offshore Wind Economic Development Act, was signed into law, advised the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities to establish a program for OREX, Offshore Renewable Energy Certificates, to incentivize wind development. January 2018, Governor Murphy signed Executive Order 8, which directed state agencies with responsibilities under OWIDA to fully implement that act set a goal of 3,500 megawatts by the year 2030. In November 19, Governor Murphy signed Executive Order 92, increased the goal 7,500 megawatts by the year 2035. If you saw the headline, September 21st, Governor Murphy signed another executive order, increasing that goal all the way to 11,000 megawatts uh, by the year 2040. Assuming they're all 12 megawatt turbines, they're probably gonna grow over time, uh, but that'd be around 900 turbines, uh, 800 to 1,000 feet tall off our coast. So this is New Jersey offshore wind solicitation schedule. Uh, they didn't update the, an updated table yet, but this is the previous goal of 7,500 megawatts. was going to be met through five solicitations. The first solicitation was issued in 2018, awarded in 2019, three offshore wind developers bid, Orsted's Ocean Wind One project, received the first bid, the OREX, Offshore Renewable Energy Certificates. Uh, they expect to be commercially operational 2024 or 2025. The second solicitation occurred in quarter three, 2020. It was split between two projects, Orsted's Ocean Wind 2 and Atlantic Shores Offshore Wind Energy. Those projects expect to be commercially operational 2027, 2029. The third solicitation was gonna occur this year. It was delayed until next year. Uh, while the state and other partners are working to try to improve the transmission of energy from these different wind farms to increase the efficiency and reduce the environmental impacts from cabling. If you'd like to take a deeper dive into many of the different elements of wind energy, one source is the uh, New Jersey Offshore Wind Strategic Plan developed by several different state agencies and with partners and stakeholders throughout the state. Uh, there's a screenshot. Uh, so the first project that received OREX was Ocean Wind One, which is Orsted, a Danish company based in Copenhagen, I believe the world leader in offshore wind development and a PSE and G project. They anticipate, I'll show you on a map where there are lease sites, um, but they got awarded 1100 megawatts. And there's a variety of resources available on their webpage. Atlantic Shores Offshore Wind received uh, Excuse me, the second bid went to Ocean Wind 2, also Orsted PSE and G. 
And the second other part of the second bid went to Atlantic Shores Offshore Wind. It's a partnership between EDF Renewables and Shell. So both of these, uh, or I'll show you now coming up here some more about each of these projects. Ocean Wind One has their construction and operations plan in review for over a year now. Um, and then the Atlantic Shores Offshore Wind also has their COP in review. Ocean Wind Two is still working on their COP. So most people, as I noted, really didn't catch wind, pun intended, of offshore wind development until around 2017, you know, from my experiences, when Empire Wind was leased by now Equinor. But this uh, wind development, the New Jersey journey, I'm stealing, adopting these slides. Uh, Will Waskis from Bohm was very much involved from Bohm in, in developing the lease sites off Southern New Jersey. He's given several great presentations on the history of the lease sites off Southern New Jersey, and I'm borrowing his slides here. But uh, he went all the way back as a major milestone, the Energy Policy Act signed by President Bush in 2005. There were interim policy leases, including Fisherman's Energy, where commercial fishermen were investing their own money. They wanted to build wind turbines on the state line uh, away from the areas where they fish. Uh, they saw it, they were trying to get out early from this wind development, be involved with it, spearhead it, make it an, also a supplement to commercial fishing industry. Uh, but for several reasons, th that project did not uh, fully take off or uh, ever, ever develop into constructing turbines. There were a few other uh, exploratory interim policy leases. Um, but the, the leases off Southern New Jersey, I mean, it was a two-year study on uh, an ecosystem baseline study available through these uh, links here to get an idea of looking at water depth, habitat substrate, all the ocean users, environmental sensitivity indexes, just a few examples of when it went into the baseline ecological studies in back in 2008, 2009. Uh, there was a series of public hearing task force meetings. I really so far I've only met one person who actually attended. I don't know what stakeholders did attend. When you go to a task force meeting nowadays, there's hundreds of people there uh, and many different stakeholder groups represent it. There were a series of task force meetings for these Southern New Jersey leases back in 2009 to 2016 and a variety of studies that went with in there, calls for information uh, to widow down uh, to the least conflicted uh, zones for leasing. Ultimately, those leases, Atlantic Shores, and now what is owned by, uh, leased by Orsted, originally Ocean Wind, those were leased seven years ago now, November 2015, so quite a while ago. So again, the first OREX went to Ocean Wind 1, here is the, one of the take-home maps from their several thousand page construction and operations plan. They plan to build 98 turbines, I believe it's 0.7 or 0.8 by one nautical mile spacing, three substations, two substations, the cables will connect, go about 40 something miles up the coast, about one and a half meter burial depth, go underneath Island Beach State Park, across Barnegat Bay into the decommissioned Oyster Creek nuclear generating plant. I think about 700 megawatts approximately are going to go up there, approximately how much energy was once being produced by that plant. The remainder is going to go into BL England, uh, a couple different landing sites uh, down in Cape May County, Ocean City and others, uh, if you're familiar with that site. Uh, Ocean Wind 2 will be further developed on the lease site here, and then Atlantic Shores is this gray area I'll speak about coming up. So if you, this is a great site to visit, the Ocean Wind One COP Construction Operations Plan is hosted on the BOEM webpage. This is a table of contents. Some of the information are, is redacted or confidential due to, for one reason at least, competitive nature of the industry and different uh, developers. But these are the information that they had to prepare and is being evaluated by in including that list of federal environmental acts I showed earlier. Uh, everything from emergency, emergency, emergency response, oil spill response plan, safety, biological surveys, archaeological and historic survey report, uh, sturgeon, marine mammals, sea turtles, navigation, air quality, fisheries, uh, just to name a couple of what's in here. So this is their plan and the appendices for environmental related issues that are being evaluated at federal and state levels for this project. 
Atlantic Shores Offshore Wind, again, their homepage. Their COP has been in review since September of 2021. So also over a year now. Um, their first, they received a portion of the second solicitation. Um, they're putting forward a plan, project one, for that first, that what they've received from the second solicitation. They put forward in the COP also project two, if they were to receive OREX in a future solicitation, included within that COP submitted last year. Uh, counter to, uh, these are closer to shore. I believe in all the Northeast, these are the closest to shore. These closest turbines are 9.8 miles from the beach off of Brigantine, New Jersey. So very close, comparatively closer to most of the other projects. Project two is further to the east, not as much to the north, uh, further to the east. Project one proposed landing uh, cabling into Atlantic City. Project two uh, don't yet have OREX for, but their proposed cabling route is all the way up to Seeger in Monmouth County. So uh, about 40 something miles there as well. Uh, a major concern depending upon the stakeholder group, but include of property owners and others in the state are the potential visual impacts of turbines. Uh, there are some studies on impacts of wind farms uh, and anticipated impacts through surveys. There's been some work off Rhode Island uh, where there's five turbines. Uh, they've shown some data from Airbnb and hotel bookings that there's been some evidence of an increase in tourism. Um, there's been some surveys in the Northeast, Delaware, I think one in New Jersey, uh, looking at um, citizen perspectives in terms of the visual impacts. Uh, my recollection from one of the other two, one of the two other ones that I saw, um, majority of the respondents were indifferent. There were some that were claiming that they would not go to the shore if they had to see turbines, and there were some claiming that they would go to see them. Uh, the conclusions of the BOEM reports that I saw was uh, maybe a net no impact uh, or uh, negligible impact on tourism, uh, but yet stakeholders are, are still concerned in different areas. Uh, Atlantic Shores linked here, they did a very thorough visual impact assessment. So again, their lease site is off, you know, it will be visible for all of L LBI, Atlantic County and down to Cape May County, uh, particularly LBI and Ocean City. Uh, stakeholders are particularly vocal and many opposed due to the visual impacts and others. So shown here is one of the sites in this visual impact assessment report. This is Brigantine, New Jersey, the state park at the north end. So this is the location where the turbines will be closest to shore. Closest, I believe, is 9.8 miles. This is, uh, I would have to revisit it, but these are the photo simulations they give. Uh, this is existing conditions from that beach. And then this is what it would look like on the days and the conditions they could simulate it, many different conditions. But this is what that approximately 100 turbine project would look like from the beach at a distance of 9.8 to about 12, 13 miles looking out to the turbines. So visibility will be in the, in the best possible conditions. Standing out on the beach was 30 something miles according to the report, but that's in the best possible conditions. It depends if you're standing on a beach if you're standing, standing on a, a road, standing on a dock on the back of a barrier island, if you're on a mainland, and you know some of the, all the atmospheric conditions and the acuity that impact your visibility. The high end is 35, 38 miles, uh, you know, but these will be visible in, in the teens. Uh, these turbines are 9.8 to 15 miles, approximately 14 miles off the beach. This photo simulation is intended to be printed out and viewed, I think 22 inches in front of your face. Uh, and you could visit these links if you like, print them out for this and many other locations to get an idea of the visual impacts anticipated during given conditions. Uh, I'm just going to run through a, a several slides here, a quick overview. That's, that's the bulk of what I had, but I mentioned Empire Wind through Equinor. Uh, they did not get OREX to sell energy to New Jersey yet, but they will be sell they did to New York. Um, so we are right now not going to be sourcing energy directly from this project, um, but environmentally, ecologically, fisheries, other stakeholders, it's just arguably basically just as much off New Jersey as it is Long Island. Um, so their, their COP is in development, it might already be in peer review, excuse me, peer review. I haven't followed that project as closely. 
Um, but here's an example for Empire Wind. Bohm has a web page for each of these wind farms. Uh, when you want to find information, this is also a great starting point. You can find out what's new, the leasing history for Empire Wind, uh, the projects that are further along. You can see stuff in their site assessment, stuff about their construction operations plan, uh, public meetings that occurred, will occur, recordings of public meetings. Uh, so here's an example for Empire Wind, but you can uh, navigate to the BOEMS webpage for all the others. I mentioned the six leases off New Jersey in the New York Bight as uh, defined here. Six leases going for up to $1.1 billion individually uh, and $4.37 billion total for those six different. And many of these, as you see here, are different developers who are coming in. Most of these are foreign companies, uh, different types of partnerships, forming LLCs uh, that have earned these uh, leases through the auction process and are then going to pursue the development of turbines at these locations. BOEM has a webpage focused in on New Jersey's activities to help home in. Um, as I referenced earlier, I showed the New Jersey offshore wind policy that was taken from this about tab. Uh, New Jersey DEP has this webpage too, or more information for New Jersey. BPU, Board of Public Utilities, has a great informational webpage as well. So if you obviously this group and others are interested in getting involved in issues related to offshore wind in different, different areas and different manners. Uh, the special initiative for offshore wind is based at the University of Delaware. Earlier this year, they came out with a public participation guide focused in on New Jersey. I think they have one for Delaware. Uh, this is just a screenshot for the state permits and approvals. I think if you printed out this whole guide, I mean, you're gonna need a large dining room table. Um, but it shows you areas where there's public comment periods, public hearing, fact-finding meetings held, the different state in this case, or federal acts, and where in the history and development of a wind farm, there's opportunities for public participation, notwithstanding uh, others in addition, um, and with your own organization or others. But this is a good thing to check out, as I think many people here are, are interested in getting involved in, in, in these projects in different ways. A few years prior, we at Rutgers, some of my colleagues, Matt Campo, Carolyn, uh, and others, they published this uh, Opportunities for Public Participation. Uh, similar types of information, it was funded by the New Jersey Climate Change Alliance. Uh, that's open access online as well. Uh, BOEM has a citizen's guide. The most recent I'm aware of was back in 2016, but so we're getting a little more dated here in reverse chronological order, but uh, there are several guides to uh, guide citizens in different er periods and how to get involved. Um, stakeholder engagement partnerships, fishing community, just more screenshots, more web pages. But uh, those of you who are or who might get involved in different ways, uh, I would recommend, you know, spending some time on this as opposed to social media and navigating your way around here and, and uh, studying up a bit. So I covered a lot of ground there in a short amount of time, but uh, we are recording. Happy to take questions now. Here's my contact information. Uh, so if we can't get through them all today, then uh, I'm, I'm here to answer as many as I can uh, afterwards as well. Well, thank you very much. It was very exciting and we appreciate how thoughtful and thorough um, th your presentation has been, um, Doctor. Kip has a couple of questions. Could you please give us a little more insight on the conflict of offshore wind with commercial fishing in terms of the nets and trawling? That's just her first question. Yeah, sure, we will do, Kip. Uh, thanks for that question. I touched on that a bit, but I'll, I'll dive into it again here. So um, our three most valuable commercial fisheries are what we would call mobile gear. Uh, the sea scallop fishery, they pull one or two of these dredges at a time. Uh, they pull them at three to four knots uh, behind the boat. Uh, usually it's about 60 to 100 foot vessels. You can see where they fish, at least in these two years, because fishery has been active for decades. Uh, the surf clam fishery, larger boats too, hydraulic dredges, our second or third most valuable fishery. These are the areas where they fish, at least in those two years. Historically, they were closer to shore. Climate change is impacting the survival and distribution of surf clams, and the fishermen are fishing for them further offshore and in deeper waters than they used to. And then squid is with a bottom trawl, which I don't have a good schematic here, but these are our primary fisheries, 
Trawl is also used for summer flounder, black sea bass, scup. Um, so these are mobile gears, boats towing these nets that have uh, their respective footprint. And these mobile gears, uh, in most instances, the way they currently fish will not be able to uh, safely and effectively fish within the turbines is the anticipation. They're not going to be excluded by the Coast Guard developers, but them fishing within uh, the turbines is not anticipated in most instances for these size vessels. Okay. And the, a lot, the, I know that the federal bottom trawl survey already came out and said that they are not going to be able to conduct their research survey in there that also pulls a bottom trawl with a, a larger boat. Um, so it's going to disrupt the fishing and it's going to disrupt the fisheries research as well. Interesting. Well, before I get to Kip's second question, um, Rich Isaac is the Sierra Club New Jersey chair, and he has a question for you. Uh, okay, well, thank you. I appreciate that, Jonathan. A couple of things, um, Doug. Uh, first, you know, considering that this is, uh, you know, you're a scientist, I, I find it interesting you didn't mention climate change, which is one of the major regions, major reasons for transitioning to offshore wind. Uh, for instance, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, talking how the climate change is actually accelerating, and that is a key reason why we need to transition away from fossil fuels. Um, and in New Jersey, where it doesn't make too much sense to have onshore wind, um, it, but it's certainly offshore wind is, is, is something that should be mentioned somewhere uh, tonight. Uh, the other thing is... Um, there's ocean acidification. You, you didn't mention that specifically, but you alluded to it. And that obviously can affect shellfish and it's already begun to get more acidic. And that is a concern from the fishing industry. Um, and of course, obviously uh, there's ocean warming, which we're all aware of, which uh, some marine life is already beginning to migrate north, which you, you didn't mention, but I'm sure you're well aware of. Um, and uh, as far as birds, which you mentioned very briefly, just so everyone knows, the New Jersey Audubon strongly supports offshore wind. Uh, they're not concerned when you're talking, you know, 10, 12 miles out. So it's, uh, there will be a little bit, but it's not something that concerns the Audubon. And, and I defer to Audubon. We're not always on the same page with them, by the way. Not everyone's always on the same page with everything, but uh, they're not concerned about offshore wind. And uh, quite frankly, Sierra Club's in a large coalition of environmental organizations that they're part of uh, supporting offshore wind. Um, and uh, on EMF, um, you know, basically what they're going to do is have those cables, not only about, you know, roughly five to six feet underneath, but they're also going to have three cables where they kind of counteract each other to a certain extent, taking care of most of the outward EMF energy. And it doesn't seem to be a problem. They've seen uh, types of marine life that are aware uh, that, that use electrical and are sensitive. They still are not affected. They, they, they seem to be aware of it, some of them, but they're not really affected. So that doesn't seem to be a major issue. And finally, if I could, I just wanted to share a picture, and then I'll be hush up and I'll be quiet, of, of the fact that while commercial fishermen obviously have concerns, <laughs> they're definitely, this is their livelihood. This is the artificial reef that it was created off of Block Island. And, and artificial reefs uh, where you mentioned the tourism's a little bit up there in Block Island off of Rhode Island. Uh, one of the reasons is the recreational fishermen may like it. While I, can, I think in generalization, you could say overall, uh, the commercial fishermen are much more concerned than some of the recreational where it's, it's divided, some are for it and some are against. But certainly, um, I do think it's been mentioning briefly that this is the artificial reef that's, you know, not only are artificial reefs uh, created when you have sunken uh, ships, but the, the bases of the um, turbines uh, can create them as well. Great points, uh, Rich, and thanks. You can tell you're involved and do your homework there. Uh, good catch that I didn't mention specifically climate change in the beginning when I was talking about the anticipated environmental impacts uh, and benefits from offshore wind, making climate change obviously impact everything from our agriculture to you know our water quality, our public health, and our fisheries. Uh, it do work on uh, species distribution shifts, uh, helping our fishing industry be more resilient to commercial fishing impacts on land from flooding and offshore from species shifts, as you noted, um, uh, a mission here this evening. But I thank you for bringing it up again. Obviously, the importance we've seen tremendous change in the last several decades of our, you know, marine ecosystems, including our fisheries, you know, in the 70s, 80s, it used to be, you know, whiting cod, you know, red hake, mackerel. Now we're, you know, we're catching cobia and sheep's head, you know, more tunas, mahi, mahi. So uh, the 
evidence of climate change is vast. I mentioned quickly the surf clam example before. So wind and other mitigating uh, other responses are needed before you know we have uh, even more drastic changes to our marine environment and fisheries, uh, which makes it difficult for the humans to respond. And uh, and I was also, I gave this talk recently and I had more slides. I wanted to condense it a little bit tonight. I guess I shouldn't have cut out my recreational fishing, which also maybe introduced some uh, other biases in my communications there. But yeah, the, the recreational fishing sector is a bit polar. Some are supportive, some are opposed for various reasons. I did give the example of how uh, early life stages, eggs and larvae of finfish and shellfish might impact it in their distribution. But the artificial reef effect, as you described, many of our species really like structure. There's an artificial reef network through DEP, 17, 18 artificial reefs. Summer flounder, lobsters, black sea bass, tatog, love the structure. So if you're trying to evaluate the impacts of wind farm development on a given species, I'd argue you got to look from the larvae to the adults. You got to look to the currents to the artificial reef effect. Uh, one trawl survey published of that first wind farm off Block Island uh, did find a threefold increase in their survey before and after construction of those five turbines. So uh, not much of a difference in their other species, if I recall, but there was a threefold increase in black sea bass around those five turbines. Excellent. Well, that's hopeful. Now, I know SUNY has a question, but before we get to SUNY, let's um, go through those folks who have written some questions. Kip's second question is, there are major plans to expand North Sea offshore wind production by the Europeans. Are there some studies coming out of the North Sea that will help to understand impacts and the ability of the turbines to sustain hurricane winds? Yeah, right on people's mind as we're still, maybe still raining outside here from Ian. Uh, I don't have specific knowledge on this, but the turbines are built to be weather resistant. I believe it's up to the high end of a category three direct hit for off here in New Jersey. They don't have hurricanes quite like we do in the North Sea, but still some monstrous storms uh, in their neck of the woods and part of the world. Um, but the there is storm uh, uh, storms up to, I think, three or higher uh, considered in, in their uh, structural integrity. That's in the North Sea, but what about in New Jersey? No, that's New Jersey there. I think it's at the high end of a three, but I would have to verify. But uh, storm uh, preparation is part of the engineering. We, we're hosting through extension a six-part webinar series. I can help share the information, but we've had two of six so far weathering the storm. It's been 10 years since Hurricane Sandy. Our last speaker was uh, Dr. Tom Harrington from Monmouth University. He was speaking about coastal resiliency sea level rise, but he's also, he's got a master's and PhD in, in ocean engineering. He's working in offshore wind. Somebody asked him that this question last week and uh, based upon his knowledge and ocean engineering expertise, he thought that uh, and the capability of the wind industry that they would be producing turbines capable of withstanding the turbine, the storms we would expect off the Northeast. Mm, which is anticipated to be hurricane three, not four or five. Not uh, the most extreme that you would have. I, that information is out there. I mean, uh, uh, oil spills, the uh, difficulties in uh, recycling the blades from these turbines. Each blade is over 100 meters. So a, a 100 wind farm turbine, a 100 turbine wind farm is like eight or nine miles of blades or more. And so uh, they're working on developing recyclable blades, reusable blades. Uh, that plus their, uh, the concerns around storm uh, resilience were things that the wind farm company have been, several of them have been uh, confronted about. So there is a great deal of news articles related to those issues in the last couple of years. Okay. I would have to verify the, the, the high end of their storm resiliency myself. Okay. Nancy has a question. You know, she, well, first of all, an assertion. It's, it's, she's enjoying this webinar and she would like to know if you'd be able to print out a list of what if, uh, of what you presented tonight um, for us to review later and send us through an email. Is that um, a possibility to have your presentation um, sent to those who wanna perhaps even review the uh, webinar itself? Yeah, it's intentional for that. When I speak in these extension, you know, for the public and industry, fishing, aquaculture industry, I include links throughout. So not only the talk, but the slides are a useful resource. So I understand you're obviously recording, that's gonna be posted in one or two places. 
If people want a PDF of the slides themselves, please email me. Uh, and that my email address is here. Happy to share with individuals who want them. Excellent. Well, um, SUNY has a question is, could you share? Oh, I think that you already answered this, but it says, um, could you share the link to the earlier Rutgers study in the chat? And can you talk a little about ongoing eDNA research being done? Interesting. Uh, is it? Is it this one that they want the link for? Uh, if so, I'll fish that up here if they can clarify which one. Uh, so yeah, I'm in terms of eDNA, environmental DNA, uh, we are Rutgers and Monmouth University. We're contracted by Orsted, Ocean Wind One project. We are, we are, they are responding to BOEM's federal guidelines to uh, conduct two years of monitoring before and after wind farm construction to evaluate impacts on fisheries resources. So the developers are funding a whole suite of different research in different areas and based upon local issues, um, but they're all responding to these federal guidelines to fund fisheries monitoring. We have seven different projects over six years that are going to be evaluating the impacts to fisheries resources of this 98 turbine wind farm. One of them, led by Monmouth University, involves eDNA, collecting water samples during our other trawl survey that Rutgers is leading. Uh, and the eDNA is going to be matched up to the trawl survey catches uh, as another surveying technique to identify what species are present and in what relative abundance, and to see if that changes after the turbines are constructed. eDNA is really emerging technology in fisheries. Some of the colleagues here at Rutgers are doing it to study river herring and shad in the Raritan River and elsewhere. In our professional societies, there are two days worth of science talks at this year's meeting of the American Fisheries Society about eDNA. So it's emerging as a very useful tool in conjunction with our other fisheries uh, surveys. Okay. Um, Dwight has a question. He's a diver, dives off of many wrecks off New Jersey. And in his community of divers, um, they hear about um, the, they have an understanding that this, the towers would draw on sea life and be good to visit. Um, now, is there anything about security about or the recreation of value to, attributed to the is, is turbine installations? Um, so for example, would a diver be able to actually also um, swim about the turbines? What are the security concerns about that as well? I, he also adds, um, for myself, I'd be happy to see the scale of population grow in the areas where they're not being dredged. And what can you say about the recreational po possibilities? Yeah, so first on the diver, I haven't been asked that. I feel like I recall that coming up at some point. Uh, if you want to email me, I can help you track down the answer to that. Um, from my recollection, my knowledge, the developers uh, are, and Coast are not going to restrict access. You're not going to be able to attach to them. Uh, so if you can anchor your boat, you can fish around them, you can drift and fish around them. Uh, the question of anchoring your boat, diving in and, and diving around the, 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 the foundations themselves, I haven't heard preclusion within those boundaries, but I can help get you a, a, a final answer. If you shoot me an email, I'll, I'll find that out for you. Uh, yeah, the sea scallops uh, in some of these areas, it, they might form uh, some form of closure effectively, MPA, marine protected area in some way, depending upon how you define marine protected area. Um, sometimes you have a lot, a lot of fishing in a marine protected area, but um, these may well function as de facto closed areas for these fisheries where they can't access them. So in some scenarios, they might form a source if they're in there reproducing and produce seed for other areas is a potential scenario for sure. Sure. Now, one question um, from John is, it looks like the leases would not be impacted on the proposed Hudson Canyon National Marine Sanctuary. Is that correct? Uh, correct. I, I don't expect, I believe, uh, that proposal to turn the Hudson Canyon into a National Marine Sanctuary. I believe they also, uh, fishing industry, environmental groups, and others are all, uh, you know, not wishing to have further wind development in that area. It's all it's ecologically important, very dynamic, very deep water. Uh, it wouldn't be a great area for a variety of reasons for, for wind inclusive of, of that, that pursuit of that monument. Uh, as the, one of the earlier maps showed, 
the other sites that are in uh, that are being uh, have call for information and nominations are further to the south. Those would in those would need floating turbines, which years ago I would go to the meetings. They say it's eight to ten years off, but we had a pandemic, et cetera. And now, I mean, that's a couple of years off from those te that technology being commercially ready. Floating turbines would be needed if offshore wind were to come off Boston because of the depth and also would be needed in different parts of the Gulf of Mexico and particularly off California and Oregon uh, where you see some floating turbines. Okay. Now, Karen has a question. I guess this more has to do with geology. In terms of driving pylons into the ocean floor, is that... Um, is drilling into the ocean floor, um, what would be the best option for sea life, especially whales and the impact it would have on their sonar? Yeah, good. I don't have much expertise in those areas about the impacts. Uh, I remember hearing, you know, some developers speak about the cabling. And, uh, you know, I, I believe if I recall, they claim six to nine months after some of the cables were laid, they expect the habitat to be returned to as it was. We have a very dynamic coast ocean, uh, mostly sandy. So the sands are ready and a lot of flux off our coasts. So that's on the cabling route. I'm not quite uh, sure of the in, uh, impacts from the pile driving themselves on the, on the benthic uh, habitat. Uh, but in terms of the marine mammals, I did reference it quickly earlier. I understand that there are, you know, time area uh, closures, sort of speak, or at least that's how we say it in fisheries, but certain areas and times are already avoided for leasing, but then different times of the year, uh, you will not be able to have construction of the turbines. And then while the turbines are being uh, constructed, there will be some measures such as ramping up the uh, pile driving, starting off slow and not very loud. So if there are any sensitive animals, they might have the opportunity to leave. And then as the pile driving gets more intense in construction, there will be bubble curtains. Like in many instances where the vessels, there'll be other vessels going around making bubbles to mitigate the dissipation the transfer of travel of the sound through the water. Mm -hmm. And in terms of- Actually, if I may interject, I believe that there's actually things that they put down on the ground there, Doug, that, that create the bubbles. And the idea would be if you had double bubble curtains where you had two rounds of them, that would be even better, but whatever. Interesting. I, I was under the impression the bubble curtains were from boats, but uh, that, that probably makes more sense if there were something on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're muted, Rich. In, in, I apologize for, for being muted, but uh, just one last thing on that. They will be certainly being aware because there, there is an effect from the sound. There's no doubt about it. And the right whales, as well as uh, there are dolphins off of parts of New Jersey as well, that, you know, that is a real fact and it has to be dealt with. So they will be actually stopping it when they see that the right whales are coming. First of all, they will take care, uh, pay attention to the migrating season. And then in addition to that, if they see them coming around, they will actually stop. So it is something that's serious that has to be dealt with and it is being dealt with to the best of uh, my knowledge. But thank you. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, another question of which, um, in terms of security um, or sabotage, it, you know, uh, this is all rather closely um, um, being built in a very concentrated area. I mean, if you had, you know, um, a, a ship automatically controlled to just go plow into them, or a ship actually in a hurricane loses steering on the capacity to um, steer, uh, it could slam into these things. Has there been incidents in throughout in, in other parts of the world where they're having collisions with these structures, and have they fared okay? Are they how are they, are they anticipating these type of things? Yeah, I. I... In terms of collisions, I know Orsted claims that they haven't had collisions at their wind farms in the EU, and they've been operating for 28 years. Uh, whether whether or not some of our Jersey boaters, the way they boat and where they fish, whether or not we'd have any instances here, I'm not sure. Um, I haven't spent too much time, you know, being attentive to those issues, not lowering their importance at all. There could be maybe some examples gleaned from the, you know, the Gulf of Mexico. There's thousands of platforms, oil platforms there. Um, all kinds of shipping, but also, you know, recreational boating and fishing. So uh, there might be some examples there. Uh, also, I don't know much about the national security, if that was also embedded in that question, but it, it, I mentioned that quickly in my talk. If there's 50 something percent of New Jersey's energy is coming from these, it does become then a, a security concern, uh, which is also uh, something I know is obviously an issue and people are working on, but I, I'm not involved in, in, that, in, that, in those discussions. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Nancy has a question is, would New Jersey be developing artificial reefs like Rhode Island and be, um, be doing mineral development? Um, this would be a good way, she believes, to make the ocean water healthy for the fish and the marine life again. It'd be a great first step in um, conjunction with offshore wind farms and making the Atlantic Ocean an outstanding habitat for marine life and plants once again. So I guess the question again is come down, is there any efforts to design these type of artificial reefs given all the benefits they might be promised? Yeah, New Jersey DEP has had an artificial reef. We have a very flat overall sandy continental shelf off New Jersey. Uh, they've since the late seventies, I believe it is, they've had an artificial reef program through DEP Fish and Wildlife. I think there's 18 or so artificial reefs in Delaware Bay, off the Del out of the Delaware River, all the way up to towards Sandy Hook. Uh, to try to build, uh, you know, artificial reef habitat. Uh, I always, you know, there's interestingly for hundreds of years, these species once existed off our coast, but hopefully providing this habitat improves their productivity. An age old question with artificial reefs are, do they uh, increase productivity by providing areas for refuge, uh, reproduction, or do they merely attract biomass from elsewhere? The attraction production debate uh, and if they attract simply more so attract biomass from elsewhere, um, but then also a very large percentage of the private boat and party charter boat recreational fishing in New Jersey occurs at our artificial reefs, it could be making fishing more efficient and making it easier to catch these animals, which are some other areas of the debate uh, discussion on artificial reefs. But on the scientific community with wind farms, we do expect some level of artificial reef effects um, attraction at least, maybe hopefully also production for different species. And particularly off southern New Jersey, I mean, the latitude is at DC. Um, we get some really warm water species off southern New Jersey. I expect, you know, Kobe, uh, Mahi, sharks, tunas that might arrive, but then it'll become a fisheries management issue because if Kobe become more abundant, we only, at least on the commercial side, the, the quota is only a thousand pounds for the whole state. I know some people who can almost catch that in one day. So then fisheries management needs to catch up with changes that are observed uh, due to wind or climate. And that's a big, a larger issue of fisheries science and management, keeping up, catching up with and responding to um, climate and other factors impacting the productivity and distribution of our fisheries resources. Excellent. Well, folks, I, I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Any, um, just uh, in the audience uh, before we close up for tonight, anybody else have any other questions? This is Kip. I just wanted to uh, thank you very much. This is terrific. Thank you. Yes, it was very enjoyable, very interesting, and uh, chock full of information. So I think I'm gonna have to watch it again to get all the details. And uh, um, but uh, thank you very much. It was uh, very, very interesting. And we're getting a lot of thank yous in the uh, chat box as well, Doug. So we appreciate the time and the effort you put into this uh, thoughtful um, presentation. Jonathan, Thanks. will will we get a copy of this? Um, uh, I, we, webinar. Um, my understanding is, is that we'll be preparing it and uh, sending it out. And I guess it usually takes about a month. Mm. Okay. Thank if you. If you want the slides, you can email me yeah. here and I'll email you the PDF. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for the opportunity, attention. Rich, thank you for the, the additives there. Some things I missed that I otherwise capture in my talk, but I uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity. Hopefully this is useful for everybody. And in addition, addition to the slides, if you'd like to contact me related to wind or anything else related to marine related issues, I'm, I'm here to serve and provide science based information. I'll be sending you something on bubble curtains pretty uh, within a few minutes. Sounds great. That's good. Uh, each time I give the, the talk or something similar, I become better prepared to answer questions in the future. Thank you. Right, well, thank you. Well, thank you very much again, Doug. And, and folks, don't forget. Um, in, Second week of next month, we're going to be having a talk by Elliot Riga on the Highlands Co Coalition um, about uh, how you can have a voice in local uh, land development issues and projects in your area, even though the property might be in the preservation. So, all right. Thank you very much, folks. Yeah.